From the heartland of the United States and one of the leading children's medical centers in the world, welcome to the Children's Mercy Kansas City Pediatric Bioethics Webinar Series. We invite international leaders to discuss critical and controversial issues in bioethics. Now, from the Bioethics Conference Center on the Adele Hall campus, here's Dr. John Lantos. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Bioethics Tower right here in downtown Kansas City. Thanks for joining us at this um, unusual hour for this week's webinar. We're thrilled to have Lucia Woschel here. I will introduce her in a few moments. But first, let me tell you about a couple of our upcoming webinars. Next week on Monday, March 4th, Joseph Millam, who's a bioethicist and a permanent faculty member at the Clinical Center uh, at the NIH, is going to come and talk about the moral foundations of parenthood. Joe has written a very nice book uh, examining some of the issues about why we give parents both the rights and the obligations uh, that we give them, and he's going to talk about some of those issues. And then Thursday, March 28th, Marsha Griffin, who's a pediatrician working down on the Texas-Mexico border, uh, doing a lot of work with immigrant children, is going to be up here and is going to talk to us about what's really going on with the care of children uh, down on the border. So that should be a, a, a great um, webinar as well. For those of you who haven't joined us before or maybe just forgot, here's the way the webinars work. Uh, our speaker will speak for about half an hour, and then we will take your questions and comments. If you have a question or comment, you've got two ways you can send it in. One, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of your computer screen, there's a little chat box, or it may say question and answer. You can just type a question or comment in. We'll read them out. If we don't get it right, type in another question. We'll read those out. Plenty of time for interaction. Or if you don't like the web interface and you are a Twitter user, you can just tweet your questions or comments in at hashtag CMBioethics, and we will read those out as well. We love our Twitter followers. We're hoping to get up to 1,000 soon. We're well on our way. Uh, also, the Sixth National Nursing Ethics Conference is coming up in Los Angeles, March 21st and 22nd. Registration is open for that. should be uh, a great event for people who are interested in nursing ethics. So today, our speaker, Lucia Woschel, has come down from Indiana. She has worked at some of the top medical centers in the country, trained at Oregon, worked at Mayo, uh, worked at Children's National, worked at the Cleveland Clinic, and now is at the Fairbank, Fairbank Center and uh, IU Health, where she serves on the Nurse Executive Council and as a faculty member in their Clinical Ethics Fellowship Program. Lucia does a lot of work on moral distress and is going to talk to us today about creating moral spaces. Thanks so much for going to Kansas City. Thanks, John. I, um, I'm happy and honored to be here, and I um, want to spend just a little bit of time sort of throwing out some ideas and hopefully engage people in discussion both in the room and tweeting and chatting. Um, we'll see how that works. I will, I will warn people straight up that I'm kind of nearsighted, so if in the room and you raise your hand, John has agreed to be my <laughs> moderator and pick on you. Um, I would tell you to do the parade wave, but that people really feel pretty shy about that. So. Um, honestly, I think uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about this. I know um, Ann Hamrick and I uh, published an article about what it means to have institutional moral spaces. And it's something that I think about a lot. I think um, when you consider that uh, part of what I hope to do today is sort of convince people that we should all be advocating um, for creating safe moral spaces, because it, it really does benefit uh, employees, it benefits patients, it, be it benefits everybody. The idea is that if you can create a space where reflection is welcome, uh, disagreements are honored um, and uh, handled in a respectful way, people can engage better in how they care for patients. So um, I will say that uh, I always write objectives. These are the objectives I'm going to cover. I don't read them because I'm sure you can read them as well as I do. So I'm just going to move on. <laughs> Um, this is a picture that I think of for years and years. People would say, oh, ethics is, isn't black and, black and white, it's gray. I don't think ethics is gray. I think ethics is technicolor. <laughs> and I think it's technicolor because if you 
are engaged in an ethically challenging case or you feel um, challenged by it, most people are pretty emotional about it, sometimes positive, sometimes negative emotions. But this is something that people feel intensely and there's nothing gray about it. Um, I tell people if you're uh, emotionally engaged and upset, the good news is you still care. Uh, the bad news is if you can't figure out how to rein that in, it's going to be hard for you to convey a message that you think is really important. So when we talk about moral spaces, um, Margaret Urban Walker published an article in 1993 which really has served as a foundation for how people think about moral spaces. This uh, quote is really, it talks about uh, structures, um, talks about uh, routines, and the mor a moral space is both a literal and a figurative thing when you consider it. It is like a room, maybe like this, where people can go and this is where they can have a discussion, but it's also a safe space in the larger sense of um, who can I talk to, what process is in place if I find myself in a challenge. And so um, when you look at, uh, these are what many people would consider um, ubiquitous ethics resources. We have these, uh, people have teachers that talk to them about ethics. One of the things I do is I teach a course in applied ethics to undergraduate nursing students. Uh, people, there are institutional committees, uh, there are uh, mentors that you have, there are uh, journals and books, there are, people have codes of conduct, this is how they're supposed to behave. And then. Maybe there are professional codes of ethics, or we have regulations. And if we have all of these ubiquitous ethics resources, how come we're still challenged by um, spaces that are not, that don't embrace uh, a moral open environment where people can share stuff? I will say that um, as far back as 1992, um, back then it was called JACO, now we call it the Joint Commission, they originally said, okay, and it was based on um, a famous case, but they said, hey, everybody should have some sort of resource within their organization to help resolve ethics challenges. But the guideline doesn't say what you should have, it doesn't define what is best practice, it just says you should have something. And so a lot of people would say, well, we're gonna embed ethics in everything we do. We have a policy that does this, maybe we have a few people, but that really isn't enough. That's sort of a baseline, if you will. It's the beginning of the bar. So when I think of um, an ideal ethics resource, and uh, full disclosure, I'm a member of the American Society for Bioethics, and uh, that is an organization that's working to professionalize uh, ethics consultation. Ethics consultation has been around for a very long time, but we're still sort of in the field kind of arguing about what professionalism look like, looks like, what training you're supposed to have, how you practice. But for me, um, this definition really does speak to how I think of ethics consultation. Um, this is the one thing that I actually do read because I think it does matter. So it's a service that's provided by an individual or a group to help patients, families, surrogates, um, and healthcare providers, pardon me, healthcare clinicians, I learned that last <laughs> night, um, address uncertainty or conflict regarding value-laden concerns that emerge in healthcare. Nowhere in that definition do you see the words fix it. Um, and I think, I know when people, uh, ethics has had a bad rap. I've had a lovely opportunity to meet with folks here from Kansas City Mercy, and I gather that you have laid the foundation and in fact have created wonderful moral spaces. But I think for many of us, there's still very much a reactive model where if there's an ethics challenge, we're gonna call ethics consultation. And the baggage that comes with that is there's always a sense that something bad is happening or something is wrong and we're not gonna call anybody because everything's fine. We don't, there's no conflict here. And in fact, what I've come to appreciate about consultation is really the goal is to provide support for sound ethical reasoning. For the most part, I genuinely think of clinicians as people of good conscience. They are people who know the right thing to do. Sometimes they struggle because there's a true dilemma. Sometimes they struggle because for whatever reason communication has broken down, maybe the trusting relationship has been fractured. Um, and for the most part, they really just need support and help. We don't we very rarely come in, um, we certainly don't ride in on a white horse, but we don't come in and say, here is the right thing to do. And here you go, thank you very much, call us when you need us next time. That is not how I think of ethics consultation. And I had an opportunity to um, do a study, an internal study that was funded at our organization. And so we looked at what does value and quality mean when you're thinking about ethics consultation? And this is some of the, uh, some of our results, I will say we always, uh, one of the questions is, were you satisfied with the service? And one thing we know is just because you're satisf satisfied doesn't mean we did a good job from ethics. As a matter of fact, if you're unsatisfied or still unsettled, that may be the best 
consult we've ever done because if it's a true dilemma, there's no one right answer. And there's going to be somebody in the room who's going to really struggle with it. I will say that um, we had people, 70% of people talked about we helped them resolve a conflict. Well, that is good. Um, people felt uh, we had about 77% of people felt we helped them clarify uncertainty. That for me is a huge, a huge contribution. So we didn't tell them what the right thing to do was, but they helped, we helped them with, uh, with figuring out what was the right thing to do. So I will say that how I think about this is we're sort of, when we come in on a consult, what, what I think we do is we're responsible for supporting and maybe creating a moral space, creating a space where people who are struggling with what's the right thing to do, where they can engage in a meaningful discussion about it. Uh, some of the quotes that came out from our study is, um, you know, we asked people, what does ethics consultation do? And here are some comments from folks. Um, I love the, if it hadn't been uh, for, um, been a part of the ethics consultation, I probably would have still believed that we, what we should have done, we should have done what the family wanted to do. So in other words, if I hadn't had a chance to really reflect on it, I might have still believed that what didn't happen was the right thing to do. I wasn't sure. It helped me realize that there's no right or wrong. Like that's my favorite quote. That is exactly what you want people to come away with is if there's genuinely no right or wrong, you've helped them see that there's another perspective, even if they don't agree with it, if they can see it, and accept it. That is an incredibly valuable thing to do. So for me, when we did this study, one of the things, you know, we, we had this little checkbox on our consultation service. What did the consultation do? Did we provide a recommendation? Did we write a note in the chart? And all those are very concrete. One of the things that we didn't have at that time, but we've since added it is, did we provide moral support? Did we reassure the team that they were on the right track, particularly when physicians are struggling and they think they know the right answer, but for whatever reason, they need they need support. Maybe it's institutional support, maybe it's just a thoughtful reflection. And it that has helped me appreciate um, the challenges that physicians face. Yes, sir. Can I interrupt for a second? Did, did you give them these questions right after a consult was done, or was this like we, no, the we, last time you called for a consult? Every, so when we did the study, people asked us, we got everybody's name, and within two, two weeks, we sent them a survey, and okay. if they wanted to participate, then they participated in an interview as well as just a survey check. So it was about a consult that had just happened. We named the consult. Yep. We said, this is the patient yep. that we want to ask you about. Yes, because we had some frequent flyers, so mm -hmm. there was more than one consult, yep. and we had first-time users and repeat users. So thank you for asking. So yes, we did it that way. So um, I love this. So available ethics resources doesn't mean that you have a moral community. <laughs> um, and I will say, we have, uh, we are, um, endowed with a, a bevy of ethics resources. We have a freestanding ethics center that's uh, endowed. We have an organization that supports my role as a nurse ethicist, which is fairly uncommon. Um, that is my job. It's not other duties as assigned. We have an ethics fellowship. We have an ethics committee. We have an ethics consultation service. So we have all sorts of stuff. And even though the general message is this is a community that supports ethical practice, Within that large organization, you have little microcultures and little micro uh, events. And I will say that we have these terrific resources, but we're still working on what does a moral community look like. And so when we think about what is a truly effective moral space, so it's one where uh, the people who are the ethics resource have knowledge and ethics. That's an essential thing. Um, the ethics resources are readily available, so 24-7, 365 days a year, I got to hand off the ethics phone for uh, coming to Kansas City, that was nice. Um, they have to be known, in other words, people have to know about it. Uh, one of the things we identified in the article that we wrote is the litmus test is if anybody working at 2 o'clock in the morning on a weekend, that's if that person knows how to find ethics, that's your litmus test that you've really achieved sort of uh, a broad moral community. Uh, I will tell you it's a tough standard to meet. We recently had a magnet visit, and one of the magnet appraisers asked a nurse, tell me about your ethics, and she said, oh, we, you know, they're not available except Monday through Friday. And I, I said, oh, part of me wants to know who the nurse was so I can follow up not to punish her, but to say, you know, for us, that's a sentinel event. That, for me, is we have to do better. We have to make sure that everybody knows how to find us, whether it's 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. And so the being known is actually a really big deal, and that they're sanctioned. So we have ethics 
And I do know from another another study that we did, um, people still experience retribution for calling for help from ethics because we can't control that. Mm -hmm. And um, this sounds terrible. I, I expected retribution from physicians because a physician doesn't want to hear that somebody called ethics. And what we hear frequently is somebody called ethics on me. We always have to reassure them that it's not about you. It's really about the patient. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the retribution came from nurses. So nurses who felt like we don't need an outsider to help us. Uh, maybe the nurse manager was spoken to by the physician and then um, stuff runs downhill. And so that happened. But that really disappointed me is that people thinking that if you call for help, um, the way to, so what does it look like to sanction it? And that means that we should be positively recognizing people on rounds. Oh, you called ethics. Thank you very much. I know uh, for me personally, when nurses call, I try very much to put into our performance management system. I have a mechanism to say, a compliment, somebody's done a good job. So I try and compliment them and reinforce that. Um, and if somebody's unhappy that a consult was called, the consult service will eventually leave the practice area, but the person who's upset will still stay. And so we can't, we can't always protect people. So I will say that um, it'll never be a perfect system and I still struggle with this, but you hope that over time, you can help people appreciate that calling ethics is not a bad thing. It's actually a recognition. It's sort of a, a bit of humility. I recognize that I'm not perfect, uh, that we could use some help here. And in fact, we could use some support. So when we think about an authentic moral space, so this is um, the expertise of clinical ethicists. This is not a, a question of maintaining um, a code-like atmosphere or any of the rest of that. It's what we do is we're architects of moral space. Um, and again, this comes from Margaret Walker. And I love that that picture that it creates is we sort of build the scaffolding and we create the support systems and we make it possible um, for people to engage in um, meaningful conversations about content that they may disagree with. So when we think about uh, moral reasoning, we're talking about um, how do I communicate and collaborate? I ask my nursing students all the time and I ask nurses in clinical practice, so how much training did you get in managing conflict? Not resolving it, but managing it. And nobody raises their hand. <laughs> because we don't teach people how to navigate conflict. And sometimes conflict is good, sometimes it's bad. And when I ask a, you know, a nurse or a physician in clinical practice, so how often do you encounter conflict? And they're like, I mean, in the last hour or like today, yesterday. And I think when we think about moral reasoning, that for me is a way to think about addressing conflict, not to resolve it. Um, so, and then I talked about external scaffolding and um, dialogue that creates opportunity. So when you think about it, we're gonna talk about this, which creates the opportunity for reflection on what are we supposed to be doing here? I could not possibly get through a talk without providing some kind of definition of moral distress, since it is what I study. <laughs> uh, you'll notice that there's more than one definition here. The um, article that I wish I had written, uh, Denise Dzinski wrote, it's called Mapping Moral Distress. And it, uh, the second page of her article, she has like 12 different definitions of moral distress. And the reason I like that is we're still trying to figure out exactly what this is. The researcher in me wants to pin it down. I want to know exactly what it is. I want to know how integrity fits into it. I want to know how external constraints figure into it. And the clinician in me wants a really simple definition. Moral distress is believing you know the right thing to do, but something or someone keeps you from doing it. Because most people in clinical practice don't think like philosophers, and they don't want a long-winded definition of moral distress. They need something that they can wrap their brains around. And so for me, when I think about moral distress, um, I have a long researcher sort of definition, and then the short version. So we talk about root causes. The triggers, actually, for me, are uh, clinical situations. There are lots of things that can trigger moral distress. I know for us on our ethics consult service, the single most frequent reason we get called for help is end-of-life situations, uh, because death is not hard, is not easy for us to do. Um, and so I think that's when people generally reach out and they want to have um, help and support in doing that, particularly in pediatrics. Um, children are not supposed to die before their parents, and yet if you work in pediatric healthcare, you know that that often happens. So the clinical triggers are varied. There are things that are internal to me. Maybe I don't have the language to use. Maybe I was trained, if I'm you know, a nurse, I was trained to be in a hierarchical situation and I'm supposed to follow orders, not question them, except under rare circumstances. There are lots of things that are external to the situation of moral distress. What's my moral climate like? Do I have a moral space? Do I have a moral community? Um, or not? 
And all of those things figure into the mix of what leads to moral distress. I will say uh, moral distress has been written about in the nursing literature for like 30, almost 40 years now. That sounds terrible. feel really old when I say that. And it did not really take off until an article by um, Pauline Chen in the New York Times in 2009. If you actually look at a, um, a grid, a bar graph, whatever, of publications about moral distress, it's pretty low, not a whole lot. I could easily keep up with it. In 2009, 2010, it did this. And if you tried to keep up with every article right now that has something to do with moral distress, you would be challenged by it. Um, my hypothesis about that is uh, moral distress, I think originally as people struggled with it in the early definitions, it sounded like, oh, it's an emotional feeling, it's when you're upset, and um, nursing is dominantly female as a profession. So I think people thought, oh, it's just the nurses being upset, they're emotional, it'll be okay. Um, and over time, particularly when Dr. Chen started publishing, she's a transplant surgeon, when she started talking about it, there was this recognition that it is more than just feeling bad. As a matter of fact, if you tell me you have moral distress, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to tell me more. Because just saying it doesn't mean what you're feeling is actually what we think of as moral distress. All distress is not moral distress. But so these articles, uh, certainly the New York Times article from Dr. Chen in 2009 sort of launched it, but we now know that uh, it's a growing problem for health professions. There are interprofessional projects that look at physicians' experience, nurses, pharmacists, medical students, uh, respiratory therapists. Everybody is experiencing this. Um, and then when you think about a call to action, what I think about is we do not need any more studies to demonstrate that people have moral distress. What I would say is we should all be checking the level of moral distress where we work, because if you have high levels of moral distress, chances are you could do some work with regard to your moral space your moral community. Which is not to say that everybody's not going to experience peaks of moral distress, but if you have sort of a sustained level, that's where you need to worry. This is a graphic from an article by Epstein and Hamrick where they talked about uh, the crescendo effect, where you think about, um, I do not use pointers because I'm sure I'm going to put somebody's eye out, but um, <laughs> if you look at the baseline, uh, everybody's baseline is low, there's some event that causes moral distress, and as uh, my uh, director of the Fairbank Center's frequent frequently heard saying, all bleeding eventually stops. So whatever triggered that particular distress, your level goes down. But it does not go down to baseline if you haven't had a chance to resolve it. You go along happily for a while, and there's another event. And it goes down, but not to baseline. And another, and another, and another. And this is sort of the cumulative effect of moral distress. And I will say that um, when I think about studying moral distress, there's an instrument that I created. And it's not rocket science. You simply ask people on a scale of 0 to 10, What's your level of moral distress? And I can tell you, uh, in my early practice, a defining moment for me on a scale of 0 to 10, my moral distress was 25. And if you let it get that high, you have a tendency to do things that are not necessarily in yours or the patient's best interest. In my case, uh, I did something that was incredibly disruptive to what a physician was doing. Um, however, the physician recognized that what I was trying to say really did make a difference. And fortunately, we had built up a trusting relationship. And she said, no, I. I understand now what you were doing, and I can see now what we need to do for this family. And so for me, that's why when I look at this graph and I talk to people about moral distress and are you navigating and managing your distress, it's really, really important that you think about this cumulative effect. So how do you deal with it? What are you supposed to do when it comes to moral distress? Well, there are things that you do individually. Um, and I will say there's a growing body of work about resilience and moral distress. And my bias is if we say to people, if you just get enough resilience training, you'll be able to overcome moral distress and navigate it. And isn't that great? And I think I cannot argue that resilience is a bad thing. It's, it is very good. But if we say to people, if you just get resilience, it's sort of like saying if you have enough courage, you can overcome it. And that just means we're putting a lot of burden on a healthcare provider who may, in fact, be facing some real genuine constraints. So there are individual things that you need to do. But when it comes to how do we deal with it, we have to recognize that where you have moral distress, high levels sustained, that is an opportunity to create a space to sort of navigate it. You have to think about it on an individual patient level. Is there a pattern in clinical triggers that happen so that instead of reacting to the next time you have a similar patient situation, can you recognize it in advance? And before people have high levels of moral distress, say, OK, Let's talk about this before it gets out of control. There are things that need to happen at a unit level, a microcosm, and then, of course, at a larger organizational level. So um, 
people are very surprised when I tell them that my interest in moral distress is not about lowering your moral distress. I'm happy when it goes down. But really, what I'm more interested in doing is helping you develop a sense of moral agency. What can we do to help you feel empowered to overcome the barrier that's keeping you from doing what you think is the right thing to do? Um, these are definitions of how you think about moral agency. And I think, um, for me, uh, early on, I thought of uh, a moral agent as someone who could see a moral problem, think about what the choices were, act on it, and be held accountable to the actions for it. So sometimes, um, if I'm thinking about being a strong moral agent and I'm in a situation, sometimes the morally correct choice is to intentionally choose not to act, even though I think doing something might be the right thing in this circumstance, sometimes people have to make a calculus and they have to make a decision about, I've chosen not to act in this one situation because I've done the calculus and I know that if I act now, I will jeopardize future opportunities to make a change. If you make that as an intentional choice, that's a moral agent deciding. If you haven't had a chance to reflect, to dialogue with other colleagues, that's when your moral distress is gonna go up because it's a default. You didn't examine the barrier and make a choice about it. You sort of felt like you had to do it. So these are some questions. Uh, I'm working on a project, working on data analysis now, and I'll tell you a little early results <laughs> about it. But um, there's an instrument that was created by Joy Penikoff to look at how do you measure moral agency. So um, these are some of the questions that are on the instrument. Uh, but basically, it encourages people, you know, how often do you think you're going to talk with others about it? Um, are you going to raise your concerns? How likely are you to talk with patients? These are all questions. And the fatal flaw in this instrument is like any self-reported instrument. It's great if I say I'm going to do it. What we really need are observational studies where you do an intervention, then you watch people and you say, did they actually do it? Did you follow up with them? But these are questions that at least get at are people, have they done the self-reflection and can they honestly say I'm more likely to do it? What I'll say is we, like there are people who feel like they don't have the tools they need and they're not likely to speak up, they're pretty honest about saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And if you've done an intervention, and at least if they say they're more likely, there's a hope that you're working toward creating a moral space and a moral community. So this for me, when I talk about how to recreate moral spaces and what do we think about moral community, it really is about how do we enhance people's moral agency? How do we help it? So there are some individual strategies that I think um, are pretty uh, effective in terms of what do I do? So uh, you can nurture supportive relationships. I think anybody who works in ethics, um, I say jokingly that nobody calls us when they're having a good time. And so <laughs> when you think about it, you will need help with supportive relationships reflecting on uh, situations that you're involved with. Because invariably, somebody's calling you because there's a tragedy. On one level, there's some kind of a tragedy. You need to learn how to manage conflict, not resolve it. I think to say that we're going to resolve conflict is naive. But how do you navigate it? How do you live in that space? Learning the language of ethics helps. I will say, um, if you're a nurse and you can speak to, uh, not necessarily use the big words, but understand the concept of beneficence, understand obligations, duties, uh, proportionality. If you can use language like that, you have more credibility. That is true of nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists, anybody on the team who can speak the neutral language of ethics. Um, it makes it less emotional and less uh, about your disrupted feelings. Engaging in difficult conversations. Uh, most people are some degree of conflict averse. Very few people wake up and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a fight with somebody today and I'm really looking forward to it. So practicing engaging in difficult conversations, I think, is an essential thing for each of us to do when we think about how am I going to be part of a moral space. These are organizational strategies. So having a champion for resources, somebody who's sort of out in the trenches um, talking it up. How do we um, locate and celebrate the spaces? How do we identify where it's done right, what people can do? Um, how do we invest in education and preparation? And we're still trying to figure out what exactly is the right education and preparation, whether it comes to preparing somebody to be an ethics consultant who's going to be the champion to sort of foster and build the scaffold for moral space, or it's the average clinical provider, um, how do we help them sort of engage this and have it be meaningful? Uh, work with professional organizations. I will say if you think about the Joint Commission's minimum standard, um, there's so much opportunity for how we identify and what is best practice and what organizations can say, just having a resource isn't enough. The resource needs to do X, Y, or Z. 
Uh, and if you think about the Joint Commission, they have some pretty uh, rigorous guidelines when it comes to certain things, uh, and so they can beef up the ethics one. And I, I want to believe that it's not about the Joint Commission setting the guideline, and that's going to motivate people, but it can, and it typically does, because it has to do with regulatory compliance. So what kind of data is there out there that there's something that works? So um, there was a study that done about ethics education. Uh, what I liked about that study is it demonstrated that it's actually post-training ethics education that has a greater impact. And for me, how I think about that is uh, before you go into training, as I said in my applied ethics classroom, if I ask students what's the right thing to do, if they're in a classroom, they can raise their hand. It's pretty easy to figure it out. When you're in the trenches and you finally have some clinical experience to sort of inform how you think about it, that's when you really start to understand how to apply those abstract principles. Uh, we did an early project where we were evaluating our unit-based ethics conversation program. We did not ask about moral distress, but people shared that with us, that having an opportunity to talk about ethically challenging stuff helped in terms of burnout, retention. Uh, in that study, we had one nurse that uh, was the poster child for how it can work. She identified having been in an environment, she left because of moral distress, because the situations were too challenging. She missed it, she came back, and having the resource of an opportunity to create to engage in ethics conversations made it possible for her to stay. Um, we, I have a colleague who published a study on nursing ethics huddles, which is people, if you think about huddles, just a quick opportunity to bring people together to talk about it, which showed um, a decrease in moral distress. And then I mentioned unpublished big capital letters there. So I've been working on an intervention study to actually measure the impact of unit-based ethics conversations, as well as the impact of public posting of aggregate moral distress scores. So if you think about CLABSI and CAUTI scores, there are quality indicators that are posted. Imagine if everybody on the unit measures what their moral distress is and you post it so people can see it. Um, the short version is participating in ethics conversations is beneficial. Uh, it does uh, increase moral agency. It increases the likelihood that people will not just engage uh, in ethics conversations, but will initiate them, at least by self-report. Um, and having an aggregate posting of scores makes people mindful of uh, what's happening in the culture around them, reaching out to people who you can see people, their scores are high, people are low. And so for me, the opportunity to create a moral space is really all about dialogue. How can I be in a safe space where we can respectfully disagree, um, maybe take our filter off and not be judged for it? Uh, and so that is really what I wanted to talk about, sort of lay the foundation for what kind of questions you have. And by the way, I do not have a magic bullet. I do not have a magic wand. I can't fix any of this, but if you have <laughs> questions and or uh, would like oh, to no, we're counting me. on you for I, answers. Yeah, I'm so this. sorry about uh, that. Um, I, just full disclosure, I do not know. So, and, thank you very much. That was great. Yeah. Um, and a nice bookend to uh, the presentation that Trisha Prentice did for us. Um, uh, earlier in the year looking at moral distress in Australian NICUs, which was pretty fascinating. I don't know if you know her work, but... She presented at ASPH and we had a lovely chat. Good. Um, for those of you online, if you have questions or comments, either type them into a little chat box at the lower right-hand corner of your screen or tweet them to hashtag CMBioethics. We will um, read those out. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about well, let me ask you one at a time. One, the, the I, for those of you who can't see this, there's a page full of questions here yes. that John has for me. So oh, yeah, yeah. So if no other questions come in, <laughs> we will have a great discussion up there. Uh, some of these are just, yeah. Uh, the case you described when you were starting out, when your moral distress level was 25, and you did something, I think you said, disruptive? Yes. Uh, is that a do case? You me, do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. Actually, it's a, I did publish it, as a matter yeah. of fact, when I was in graduate school. Um, I had a fabulous professor who taught nursing theory. Now, I have a PhD okay. in nursing, so I can do this. <laughs> I mean, seriously. And I took that class after working nights and did not fall asleep. She was amazing. And one of the challenges was if you had an exemplar moment that defines your clinical practice, write about it. Mm -hmm. And so mine was um, Advocacy in Action was the title of the article. The neonatal intensive care case, that's my clinical background. Mm -hmm. We had a baby who had multiple congenital anomalies. She was mostly stable in the unit. Um, she's my primary patient back when we got to do primary nursing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took report from a new graduate nurse who described how the baby was. And to a new nurse, everything seemed sort of okay, but to an experienced nurse, this baby was on, on the edge of coding. So I went to the charge nurse and I said, just heads up, 
I just want to know the baby's going to code and just make sure somebody looks after my other uh, assignment, my other patients. And within 30 minutes, sadly, I was right. Mm -hmm. After a three hour resuscitation where a baby went from being on a nasal cannula on full feeds to being paralyzed, intubated, NPO, and as you can imagine, not in good shape. And the we brought the mother in. Um, this is in the article, so you cannot make this stuff up. It's like a bad Grey's Anatomy episode. Uh, she was in prison, and she came in in shackles and chains because she was an escape risk. Uh, she had on isolation stuff because there was concern about um, HIV. It was the early days of HIV. And the, the physician says to her, we're cautiously optimistic <laughs> about how this is going to turn out. And I thought, based on what? So two weeks later, uh, we had literally not budged, still intubated, still paralyzed, still... And we had several episodes of documented PAO2s in the teens, which, if you know anything about a developing brain, low oxygen levels are not good. Um, and so the another physician was on the phone talking to the mother who was in the chaplain's office at the prison. She got one phone call a day, update, and the physician, and if you work in intensive care, we do a disservice to parents. They call and say, you know, how's the baby? And we say the baby's stable. Translation, didn't code last night. Right but they're not improving. And so she was going on and on about how stable the baby was. And while she was on the phone with the mother, I started yelling at her. And I said, why don't you tell her what low PO2s do to the brain? And you know, what are we doing here? And this is crazy, can't we reframe this? And I shrank away thinking, oh, it's okay, I'll get a job somewhere, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> and she hung up the phone and she stepped back and she said, I said, I'm so, so sorry, that was completely inappropriate of me. I know you were trying to talk to her. And she said, no. Um, when I reframed it into how you were talking about it, she understands now. She understands what we need to do and she'd like to stop and we're gonna move forward with making arrangements for her to come in. Because, and, and so for me, I learned several lessons. One was bedside nurses have a perspective which they need to learn how to voice and share with the medical team. And uh, don't let it get out of hand. I was lucky. I mean, it was completely inappropriate what I did and disrespectful. And we had a long enough working relationship that she understood what I was trying to do, and she could overlook the emotionality of how I did it. So. But, but a great example, I think, of what you were talking about in this talk. I mean, it yeah. seems like uh, I didn't know a, how to a situation say where there was no moral space. Nope. And it wasn't that the physicians didn't want to talk about it. I mean, there were there were political things involved, like the patient originally was on the surgical service, no surgeon ever stops, the patient had to be trans transferred to the neonatology. I mean, you know, all of that stuff. It's always complicated. And it's always complicated. And, I, and she didn't, she wasn't, as a matter of fact, her response to me reassured me that there was a moral space that I didn't know existed. Because she... She accepted what I was trying to say, not how I was trying to say it, and she made that space safe after that. She, she didn't punish me. She could have. Mm -hmm. she, I don't know that she should have, but she clearly um, could have made a big stink about it, and she didn't. As a matter of fact, she could see it. She was reassured. So I did not know that there was a moral space there. I had never challenged it. I didn't know how to raise my voice. If I'd figured out how to raise it a little bit sooner, it might have been less traumatic for me. It's an interesting idea that there might be sort of potential moral spaces that are unrecognized that we don't you, know until you we have try. to walk into in order to. You have to be willing to take a chance. Yeah. You do. Um, again, uh, type in your questions in those chat boxes. We have a couple uh, questions from uh, our online audience. Go ahead, Jeremy. We do, and the first one gets right to the chase. Is there a strategy that you have found useful to justify this to administration? <laughs> one barrier always seems to be showing that more caring work, such as tending to moral feelings and spaces, is hard to sell to administrators often looking from a business mindset. Yeah, so that's one reason I'm doing the study that I'm doing and looking at how do we measure this. And uh, one of the things that's cited in the literature is uh, people often identify if you have high levels of moral distress, you're more likely to leave your position. And so uh, this is a turnover retention opportunity. Um, what, you know, the, if you look at, and there's work, the average, does anybody know how much it costs to replace a nurse? Just the average nurse? Anybody want to make a guess for those of you in the room? How much money? 100,000. 100,000. I'm, I'm impressed. 100,000 dollars because you have to recruit, hire, train, and hopefully work to retrain. And that's a spectrum because that's the 
I want to say the general nurse, if you're hiring an ICU or an OR nurse, the costs go up. So if you think about every nurse you lose, uh, that's millions of dollars. When I did my original study about the moral distress thermometer, we had 10 people who identified as identifying that they were thinking about leaving. That represented at that time, you know, a boatload of money that was well over a million dollars. Actually, no, we had 32 people because I remember it was 200. It was a lot. It was a lot of money. And that's that's how we think about it. Um, I see nurses in the room. I know we have nurses online. There is yet again a looming nursing shortage. The average age of a nurse is uh, it's pushing 50, I think, and it's hard work. So we are losing nurses. There are not going to be enough of them. And thinking about how we retain them, and not just retain them to keep them, but retain them and have them be healthy. This is, you know, you're never going to be able to prove the dollars and cents. But I can tell you the next study that we need to try and do is tie moral distress scores with age cap scores. Like, how would you look at, because every, and they understand age cap scores. <laughs> they totally understand the age cap scores. I will say that um, we don't spend enough time looking at are our clinicians healthy enough emotionally, and uh, do they feel like they're doing good work? Anne Hamrick has a favorite quote of someone from her study, a, a nurse who left, left after high levels of moral distress, and the quote is, she had to leave because she needed a job that didn't hurt her soul. What, what do you want to correlate them with? I'm not familiar age with Age cap scores? You don't know what age cap scores? I do not. Age cap scores. I can't do the technical definition, but it is scores quality that drive. Things. Say that again. Quality yeah, it quality is. Th items that we're following, like um, bloodstream infections. Okay. And pressure pulses. Yeah. So if you can tie low levels of moral distress okay. with lower levels of quality indicators, because that is that is the theory. Mm -hmm. right? Also with employee satisfaction scores, there are every organization does, well, hospitals certainly do, uh, employee satisfaction scores. If you could tie moral distress scores with employee satisfaction, you would see a link. I mean, I know that from, from the study that I did, I can identify which units had a healthy environment <laughs> and which units didn't, um, based on how willing people were to engage in discussion how uh, safe they felt and when they talked about experiences with ethics consultation. So, you know, the, I know the bean counters want to see clear data. Um, that's part of the reason I did this study. If you could ask uh, leaders to do a regular assessment of moral distress on their unit, just like check the pulse. Mm -hmm. how, how are we doing? Instead of the big annual employee survey, which you may have caught me on a good day or a bad day, or the age caps or the rest of that, if you did, sort of a regular check of where moral distress was, you could see how your staff was doing. And as a leader, you could identify, gosh, I have three people in the red zone. Um, and I realize I'm speaking a sort of a foreign language, but I'm doing another talk later about what that means. Or red zone is if your level's high, that makes perfect sense. If I have three or four people in the red zone, I need to think about, am I reaching out? Who do I tap into? What kind of ethics issues? So. Um, I don't know that that answers the question. I wish I had the magic bullet. I wish I could tell you for every drop in uh, points on the moral distress thermometer, that's uh, three nurses that are going to stay two more years. That would be really nice if I could tell you that, but I can't. One of the things that people also find troubling is if you participate in an ethics conversation, what we learned is sometimes people's moral distress score goes up, and they felt badly about that. But here's the deal. They went from one or two to maybe three or four. So if, if you work in a hospital environment where you take care of seriously ill patients and your moral distress score is zero, I'm actually worried about you. More worried than if you were a 10. <laughs> because if you're zero, I worry that you're not seeing ethics issues or you're there but not present. And so what we saw is people who had low scores actually came up. And so for me, that's awakening a sort of moral sensitivity an awareness of what's around them. But people who had high scores, they came down. Nobody who had a higher score went higher after participating in an ethics conversation, the high scores came down. So people tend toward the mean. That's how you think about it. Have another one? Yeah, so we have two questions uh, that are wanting you to distinguish between moral distress as a kind of a single experience from two related phenomena, one of which you talked about and one of which I don't remember you mentioning, which is the concept of moral injury. Yeah. Um, and so the one question is about how you distinguish moral distress from moral injury. And then um, the other one is about the crescendo effect and, and whether or not that requires a different uh, 
uh, form, uh, the, how we address that, is that going to be different than a single episode? Right. Does it require a more engaged or extensive process to deal with? Let me start with the crescendo effect because that may be easier. The crescendo effect, if you think about it, what that is is cumulative moral distress. And so if you fail to address it, by the time it gets really, really high, I mean, that's the, if you look at um, Ann Hamrick's work and Beth Epstein's work, that those are the people who've been in practice for a long time and their levels are really, really high. They've stayed in practice, but they're really, really high. So when you think about how do you address the crescendo effect, um, you can measure it. Uh, they've created a, a longer instrument that looks at it. The moral stress thermometer sort of looks at acute distress, like in this little episode. If you've if you've measured it and you've seen that it's gone up from the crescendo effect, that's sort of a long-term, what you know then is you have systemic problems, right? It sort of happened over time. I'm not sure that that answers the question about the crescendo effect, but it is, it's a longer-term, deeper dive in terms of interventions to address. I think there may be a pointing to the individual who's suffering from the crescendo effect, how, how would they go about <laughs> addressing their own? Yeah, uh, I, I do get the systemic uh, uh, um, attention that's needed, but I think this person may be asking more about the individual suffering from So as an individual, I think um, one of the most effective tools, whether it's thinking about developing your own capacity as an ethics person, is self-reflection. Can you hold up the mirror and say, what am I feeling? What am I experiencing? What's contributing to it? I mean, I, it, it sounds crazy, but the only way, the only way that I can think of for to help people outside of their distress is get outside your head and find a trusted colleague that you can talk to about it. And I would say also, um, I would refer them to Denise Dzinski's work on mapping moral distress. Um, I'm going to talk about that later, but the person who's on the webinar, um, I think, I know I gave you guys a list of references, but I don't, I said, let me see. Nope, it's not there. It's not there, but it's Dudzinski, D-U-D-Z-I-N-S-K-I. I wish I could tell you the year. I think it was 2015, but I'm not positive. It's Mapping Moral Distress. You can find it on Google Scholar or PubMed, but she walks through mapping it, and that's, that's really what individuals need to do is to map it. And you asked about moral injury. How do I distinguish moral injury from moral distress? Um, well, the researcher in me would refuse to answer the question because I haven't done a deep dive in moral injury, but the clinician in me would say um, moral distress is an experience, moral injury is what may result from it, and sometimes injury is recovered and sometimes it's not. I mean, it depends on how big the distress is. When I first started talking about moral distress, every time I do a talk about moral distress, somebody will come up to me and tell me about some episode in their practice, and in some cases it's 20, 30 years previously, and they have not overcome the distress of failing to do what they thought was the right thing to do. That's moral injury. If I have a landmark event and I know that I didn't do the right thing and something bad happened from it, I think that's moral injury. Go ahead, Andrew. Just talking about the crescendo effect and the individual versus systemic, it seems like one of is the individual needs to be able to get to a point and say, I have to speak up or I yep. have to act. I can't, if they want to have an effect on their individual moral distress, which leads then hopefully to systemic change because there's probably other nurses in that same setting yep. experiencing the same thing. And so if the good news is the first risk that you take can be simply finding a trusted colleague, not not the big dramatic story that I told, but finding someone you can talk to and say, hey, are you feeling this? And I think that's why our ethics conversations, I think, are so useful. What we learn is people in the room hearing, particularly novice nurses, hear experienced nurses talk about it and share their experience. One of the most frequent things we hear people say is, gosh, I thought I was the only one. And the only way you're going to know if you're not the only one is if you take a chance and talk to somebody. So I do know that having a facilitated conversation is what's um, most beneficial for creating a safe space because you if you take a chance and talk to a trusted colleague um, that may not go well <laughs> it may be somebody who themselves has enough moral distress that they can't talk about it but I, I'd say you have to get outside your head right and I think that was one of the things I was going to lead to is if an, an organization does lean I'm very interested now in reading more about ethics huddles because we're at a huddle and if issues are being brought up about other things we're measuring why are why don't we measure moral distress and bring it up at the huddle. It could be something that you could develop because it's an opportunity to speak up 
a lot of times it's your fellow nurses, but if we identify those situations like we do other things we're measuring, maybe that's an opportunity to create systemic change. Yeah, I would say I have a I have a fantasy that any time you have a challenging case that the attending physician will say to the team, all right, where's everybody's moral stress? Tell me. And if there's somebody who's really high, then the team will say, all right, let's talk about it. And that, I think, would be a proactive model that you would certainly promote. Not wait till it's in place and the rest of that, but basically ask people, you know, how, how are you with the plan of care here? Could you say a little more about how these unit-based unit ethics conversations work? Are they um, once a week, once a month, as needed? So um, part, of, <laughs> yeah. part of my challenge, uh, at their peak, um, we had scheduled over 100 and did 70 on the Academic Health Center campus. That was at their peak. We've had multiple changes in leadership, multiple changes in structure, multiple changes, multiple changes, multiple changes. Currently, we don't have any routine ethics conversations scheduled, which for me is very difficult because I have people who read the work and say, oh, tell us about your ethics conversations. Like, well, they sort of work. There's one reason I did this study. But the way that they can work is certainly on a PRN basis. If you've mm -hmm. had a particularly challenging case, um, you can contact us, the Fairbank Center, and ask, can somebody come and help us do an ethics conversations? We are happy to do that. There are units that are what I refer to as um, at risk for ethical conflict because of the nature of the practice that they have. And my hope is that those units will see the results of our study and go, oh, we should do that, <laughs> as sort of a proactive approach. So from my standpoint, I would hope that every unit would have an opportunity to have an ethics conversation on a regular basis. The way they work, uh, in their best sense, they're interprofessional, meaning they're at a time when everybody can come. That's the first stumbling block that we learned. My study was meant to be interprofessional, and the workflow of the different members of the team is so different mm -hmm. that virtually the only time they can get together is when they're rounding on patients, and then they each have different workflows. So ideally, it would happen on a regular basis to be proactive, but certainly in response to a particularly ethically challenging case. I know in our case, if we have an ethics consultation, and in doing the consultation, it's clear that moral distress is high, our follow-up is to reach out to those individuals and say, hey, would you like to have uh, an opportunity to talk informally about mm -hmm. what happened? So the way it works is a facilitator comes and says, you introduce yourself and you say, we're here to create a safe space. Facilitator from the... From the Fairbank Center. Yep. yep, from the Fairbank Center. I do most of them because mm -hmm. um, that's part of my job, but we train other people to do them. And we say, have you faced any ethically challenging cases? We're usually met with crickets uh, when that starts. And then part of my role as a facilitator is to have topics or questions that I can ask. And once you get people talking, it sort of spills out. And people... So the, the challenge of the facilitator is to let people swim in that emotional space and then bring them back down and tie it to the ethics issue that's leading to it. And then eventually they'll go back up into this space where they're not spinning, but the emotionality is charging. And then we say, let's go back down. So not quite like that, but, and our, we don't, our, and we tell them straight up, our goal is not to fix it. Uh, we can't make it better. We have no magic wand. But what we do know is that when people engage in thoughtful, reflective discussion, they help each other. Sometimes they come up with um, ideas for how to address if it's a systemic problem. Um, that works. And so we close out the discussion by reminding people of the ethics issues that we've talked about, sort of give them the language of ethics, and then um, people return to what they were doing. I will say that um, I, I think Beth Epstein was the first author. Um, they published a study a project on um, a moral distress consultation service. Mm -hmm. So it works in a similar way. I know our colleagues in the Netherlands call it moral case deliberation. So the idea is to invite different opinions to be shared in a space where people are not judged for having a different opinion. And that's really the essence of what it's about. And to always bring it back to ethics. Mm -hmm. I think leaders often worry that, oh, people are just going to come and complain about X, Y, or Z, and it's a set. And I'm like, nope, that's, we, don't, we don't allow that. We channel no, it. No whining. Well, there's whining, but it can't continue. Like, you can't <laughs> stop them from starting, but it can't continue. Our goal is to move them beyond that. And if anybody online has some experience at your own place, we'd love to hear about it. Just type it in, Charlotte. How, do, how does it work in our PICU? In our PICU at Children's Mercy, we have a monthly um, PICU ethics forum. Um, it was challenging in the beginning. Um, uh, some of the challenges we had was the, um, the timing. So we um, back it up to a PICU council meeting where a lot of people will be coming, have the day off and come. It's also at 8 in the morning where night shift can more easily maybe attend. Um, 
one of the one of the challenges in the beginning, or I think people thought it was going to be a care like a care conference, and so it took a lot of effort to it not turn into a s specific patient related care conference, but more ideas and feelings. And um, but um, actually, I think it's um, it's we took a little leave um, recently, but have resurrected it since then, and I think. Um, I think it's very, very helpful in our unit. We have a lot of high, um, a lot of moral distress can go on in our unit. And I think the more we talk about it, the better we are. And also you have to reiterate that it's, we don't have the answers. We're just here to talk about it. Um, and I would say too, that our administration is pretty helpful. Um, if anything, I think when they are anticipating the PICU as having increased moral distress, they have a tendency to feed us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you look at that as maybe not a fix, but it's definitely a caring gesture. It's a sign of caring. Yes, absolutely. One of the things I've noticed in the PICU ethics forum seems to be, although I want to get your opinion on this, almost the opposite of the crescendo effect in the following sense. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. It seems like there's much more moral distress from the newer, younger nurses who are seeing something for the first time that they hadn't experienced before and are confused about, puzzled about, don't know how to process. And the more experienced nurses and the people from the ethics center then say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember feeling like that. I mean, it's sort of a, 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 a professional development thing mm -hmm. rather than Absolutely. a cumulative effect. Is that, do you see that as well? We do actually. And in, in the study that I'm involved with, I had a, a colleague who added on a qualitative component and she did interviews. And in fact, that is exactly hmm. what we see is that uh, it's an opportunity for newer nurses to engage. So when you think about it as a reverse of the crescendo effect, what I would say is um, having been the facilitator for most of them, the senior nurses may have higher levels, but as they hear others talk and as they share their experience, it sort of comes down and it helps to lower the novice nurse's level. So you think mm. about it like mine is high for this reason because I'm experienced and I like this is the 10th time and we still haven't gotten it right. And then, oh, it's my first time and it's terrible. And then they both, as they share, they both come down. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of reverse. But I would say um, the mentoring that goes on and that's why I think of it as a retention opportunity, because if I'm a new nurse and I'm really struggling and I think I'm doing something wrong and I haven't talked to anybody about it, right. but then I hear a more experienced nurse say, oh, let me help you understand how this happens. Let me help you understand. And by the way, most times when people feel like, oh, the wrong thing is happening, most times they actually don't have the whole story. Right. And once they hear the whole story, it's amazing how fast their distress comes down. And the only way you hear the whole story is to hear from other people. And so I think the sharing, I mean, that's community. So I absolutely agree with you. That mm. That's what happens. I we should write a paper. I think another really valuable piece that we've learned is that the um, nurses see that the physicians are just, just as distressed and the physicians will um, appreciate the nurses' distress. And I think that realigns that we're on the same team. Mm -hmm. So the best rounds are, or conversations are when everybody's in the room. Right. When you can't have everybody in the room, um, it is it is not uncommon. I'm a nurse, so I can say this. It's not uncommon for nurses to, oh, maybe think about starting to bash the physician. Yep. And, and so what I will often say. Or the say intensivist or the bash intensivist, the surgeon. Either one. Like there's <laughs> there's, there's a lot of finger bashed. pointing. Yep. And for me, one of the most effective strategies is to say to uh the person who's doing the finger pointing. When was the last time you reached out to that person? Yep. And can you imagine what it's like to do X, Y, or Z? And if people are genuinely engaged, they, they'll they step back and it is an aha moment for them. And I know when I say that to nurses in particular who are frustrated with what, a physician, what they perceive a physician is or isn't doing, particularly when it comes to non-beneficial treatment, potentially appropriate, inappropriate treatment, whatever the new language is. <laughs> if you ask them, have you ever talked with a physician about what it's like to be the one to say to a parent, a patient, family member, I'm so sorry, we can't fix this. And you're 
loved one's going to die. Like the incredible burden that they feel. And when nurses, and nurses are inherently compassionate people, and as soon as you help them go, oh my gosh, I never thought about that, that opens a door. And again, that's about building relationship. That's about creating a space and seeing somebody else's perspective. So for me, one of the... Yeah, we've, we've certainly had those moments. I think that's what you were talking about. Yeah. It's even better when the, when the doc's there yeah, it, expressing it's, their own... So I will say our poster child for the most effective unit is a unit that routinely participated in regular UBEX. Mm -hmm. And they were interprofessional. And they, they came, everybody talked. It was great. Over time, the medical leadership said, gosh, we really need to do something about this. They partnered with the nursing leadership. We did an intervention study tied to quality indicators, length of stay, long stay, long stay patients in the PICU, and demonstrated improved communication, lower moral distress. And that worked, and their culture changed because everybody was engaged. I have another unit that was, they always had UBEX, but it was only the nurses who came, and no matter what we did, they, they never moved. They never, and, and you know, as a, as a nurse who's like, come on, you guys, like, bring your physician colleagues. That was frustrating for me. I think the successful culture change, what you describe in your pick, you is when everybody's at the table. Unfortunately, we have to stop, but thank you very much. Great talk, great discussion. Anybody who's around Kansas City, Lucia's going to be doing a brown bag lunch at noon in the community room at Children's Mercy. Come on by, bring your lunch. Thanks thank you. for coming. You're welcome.